How's everybody doing this morning? Yeah, good. Everybody get a uh, good, good dinner yesterday. If anybody needs a good sushi place, Masu Sushi, oh my god. Flame, like sushi came out flaming, it was great. So today I'm gonna talk about jQuery Mobile. Um, but first before I do that, I'm just gonna introduce myself. My name is Ralph Whitbeck. I am a uh, jQuery board member. I think it's been about four years I've been on the team and board. Um, I'm also on the jQuery mobile team as the developer relations lead. And I work for a company called Appentu, and uh, I am the modern web advocate for their tools and services. Please, please, please tweet at me at Red Wolves. I'd love to hear your feedback and uh, see what you're thinking of, of the talk as I go. One thing I learned yesterday was, um, you know, it was hard to see some of the slides on, on the screen, so I put my slide deck up on speaker deck. So if you go to speakerdeck.com slash rwitbeck, um, it, it'll be the first talk in the list of talks that I have up there. So please feel free to go to that and follow along as, as we go. I'll leave that there for a second. So let's talk about why jQuery Mobile. Why did we come up with this framework for, um, for you to all to use to build mobile applications? And um, where we want to start is we want to look at, look at the data. And so, you know, the mobile web is massive. If you look at the audience that we're trying to reach, um, the, a recent report says 6.8 billion cell subscriptions are out there in the world today. And it will surpass the population of the world by the end of the year, predictions are. A really cool stat is uh, if you look at Egypt, 70% of the population in Egypt are gaining access to the internet through the mobile devices only. That's staggering. If you compare that to uh, the US, only 25% of uh, the population is accessing the internet through a mobile device. But more importantly, the best st statistic for the US is 75% of Americans take the phone with them to the bathroom. <laughs> now the other 25% are either lying or they're leaving it for others to gain, and that's where the poopin' hashtag came about for Twitter. <laughs> if you need rules, poopinrules.com. Great, great game. People love it. How many people have played the game here today? <laughs> or, or, this, or at the conference? <laughs> anybody get, anybody? No? Oh, we gotta play, come on guys. All right, so, you know, uh, a lot of phones out there, and they're not all iPhones either, you know. Um, uh, BlackBerry came out with a great, great phone, the Z10. Uh, Samsung and, and Android have some great phones. The Nexus 2, or the Note 2, I went to Korea last year. That's, you know, everybody had those things. And the Windows phone is becoming popular as well. So you gotta think outside of just the iPhone, you gotta think of all the devices. In 2017, um, over 10 billion mobile web devices are going to be available or are going to be out there. So we really need to consider mobile as we go forward. And mobile is still the web. People are, are accessing the websites on their phones and they want that to work as they expect it on the desktop. They don't want a mobile version or uh, anything else. They want to have the exact same experience on their phone that they're going to have on a desktop. So let's, let's explore what jQuery Mobile is. What is jQuery Mobile? So our philosophy is we want one code base that works across all platforms. It's gonna work everywhere, and the experience that you get is based on the capabilities of the device that you have. It's all built on top of standards, so HTML5 and CSS3. We're really relying on those to, to provide this framework. And it's built on top of uh, the library that you know and love, jQuery Core, and it's also built on top of jQuery UI. Some features that, that it has, um, it provides a unified user experience across all devices, so you can have a similar experience through any device that you uh, build for. It has accessibility built in, so if you rely on screen readers, you can rely on jQuery Mobile to provide an experience that you can use. It has both touch and mouse events, so a jQuery mobile site will work both on a desktop and a mobile device. And we use progressive enhancement to sort of enhance our experience 
for users of devices that are capable. And we do this, uh, before we do this, we have to evaluate each device so we can understand you know, what the device is capable of. And we, when we do that, we rate it, we give it a graded browser support. And we rate it as either an A grade, a B grade, or a C grade. Now, an A grade device uh, will be fully capable, fully enhanced, will be able to do the AJAX page transitions. A B grade will have um, the enhanced experience, but won't be able to do the AJAX page transitions, and that's okay. And then you have a C grade, which is sort of your basic HTML, no enhancements, a functional site, but they'll still be able to use your site, they just won't have all the bells and whistles that come with the framework. And you can see a full device list at jQueryMobile.com slash GBS. What about native apps? Can jQuery Mobile build native apps? And the answer to that is yes. You can build your, your application just as you would. And you, we, we really love uh, Cordova Phone Gap. You know, wrap your application in that, and you can tie into the native uh, features of the phone, so like the camera, the acceler accelerometer. And then you can use that to compile to different devices and send that to the, their stores. So we really have the ability to do both you know, web applications as well as native applications. So how many here have not used jQuery Mobile before? We are new to it. Well, that's a pretty good, pretty good bunch. So the next couple slides, I'm just going to show you, you know, how to how to get jQuery Mobile going in in a web page. So, you know, you you still start with a typical HTML5 page. You got your doc type there, you know, HTML head. Then you start with this meta tag with a, a with the name of viewport. And what we're going to do is we're going to uh, set the width to the device width. Some phones and some devices are setting, are cheating a little bit and setting the width to say 960, so that you get the, you know, you get the full view of a website when you load up the phone. But we don't want that. We want to be able to set the width to its device width, so that we're getting the actual true pixels. We also want to set the initial scale to be one, so we don't want it to zoom in. We want it to be actual pixels. Next thing we want to do is we want to load in the jQuery mobile theme that we're going to use. In this example here, we're using a, a, the default theme. So uh, the CSS comes first before the, the JavaScript. Um, and then we're going to load in the version of jQuery that is supported for the version of jQuery mobile that you're using. Now, this is important um, to understand. Uh, a lot of times we see when like, a ver new version of jQuery mobile comes out, Instantly, everybody's putting in that new version of jQuery into the J jQuery mobile uh, application that they're running. And you, know, you have to sort of wait until jQuery mobile sort of catches up, you know, tests all the new features of jQuery core, um, and, and make sure that you know, it comes out with a new version. We see a lot of bugs that come you know, right after uh, a jQuery core version comes out and saying, hey, this doesn't work, and that's because we haven't tested. So make sure that you're using a version of jQuery core for this version of jQuery mobile that you're, that you're using. You can understand that by going to the download page on our site. Next, we want to load in uh, our jQuery mobile JS file, and uh, then the rest is our typical body, body tag. And so let's take a look at what uh, anatomy of a page would look like. So this is sort of, think of this as your boilerplate, right? You're going to start with a div that has a data role of, of page. Now, jQuery Mobile is a declarative markup language. So um, a lot of we, the framework relies a lot on descriptive uh, data attributes. So here we're going to describe um, our, our div element as a page using the data, data attribute of role. And then we're going to provide it some other elements within there. We can provide a header, a content, and a footer element. And you can see how they, uh, the framework uh, takes these descriptive elements and sort of styles it automatically without any CSS that you provide or anything. We're, we're styling a header. Uh, we're giving some padding to the content. You can put any content in, in here that you want. And then a footer. And you know, we get a, another bar at the bottom for the footer. And all these are optional. You don't have to, to put any of these in there. One of the things that's re really um, 
you know, beneficial of this is, you know, a jQuery mobile application is a single page app. Um, and so when you navigate to other pages within your application, these pages are sort of just, you know, being inserted into the DOM and loaded. And so we can have multiple pages uh, declared on one, uh, in one file. And so in this example, we're seeing two divs with a data role of page, and they're both identified by different ID number or ID tags. Uh, one thing to note there, uh, your IDs should be unique throughout your application, not just the page that you're on. Because we're a single page application, and we're loading in pages um, into the DOM and injecting them into the DOM, you want to make sure that all your IDs are unique throughout, not just the page that you're on. So in this example, we're navigating between the pages by just referencing the, the ID tag uh, within the href. And so we can navigate back and forth between pages here. And you see we're just getting a simple fade in transition when we go back and forth. So let's talk about themes real quick. So theming uses, uh, relies a lot on the CSS3 properties. Um, we pr provide multiple color swatches. We have an icon set that is sprited so that it loads down just one file instead of multiple smaller image files for performance. Uh, the default theme comes with five swatches labeled A through E. And if no swatch is specified in, in your application, uh, we're going to use the default swatches that uh, the framework provides. You know, we're going to use the A swatch for headers and footers, and we're going to use the C swatch for all the content. So what do these swatches look like? So the, the team put some thought together behind you know, some of the color, color sequencing here. So the A swatch is a, you know, a high level visual priority swatch. So it's, you know, it's, got, you know, it's right in your face, it's black. A B swatch is a secondary level type of swatch. It's sort of blue and gray. A C, C swatch is gray, it's sort of the baseline theme. D is sort of this alternate secondary level. You know, it sort of looks like C. It's got a little different shade of gray. Then E is your yellow, and we use this to you know, for accent type of things. Down here, we have a little code example of how we set the, data, uh, set the theme on elements. So we have a data, data roll of page, and we're going to use uh, another data attribute to um, set the theme. And we're gonna just going to set it to the letter swatch that we want to use. Um, and then here, uh, and then all these, these swatches actually um, are inheritable down into the children. Um, so we could actually set a different swatch here. We could say this could be a, a C, C theme for the header, and then everything in the header would be using the C theme, C swatch. Um, you can create your own uh, themes by going to our theme roller, uh, jQueryMobile.com slash theme roller. And this will allow you to build a theme, download its CS CSS file, then you can take that file and insert it into your, your application. So just a quick, quick demo of the theme roller. Unfortunately, these um, displays are at 1024, so we're looking at not a lot here. <laughs> there we go. So the theme roller will load up. And we'll get, um, so we get a, uh, a base base theme that we can start working with. We have three swatches that we can work with. So here's C, uh, here's B, and here's A. If you have a wider monitor than the projector that I'm using, they'll all be you know, sort of stacked next to each other. Uh, there's this inspector here where I can go and sort of you know, click on the header, and I get to see the, uh, all the details, and I can sort of you know, change the text colors, shadow, or background color right here by going in, into this column on the left. The other cool part about this is, you know, there's a, all these colors up top, and I could take, say, a red and drag it into the header, and sort of, you know, the colors are just changing automatically. You see where the color changes in, in, the, in the column on the left. Uh, we provide, like, this Adobe Cooler Swatch uh, kit where uh, the community is putting together colors that work together, and you can bring that into Theme Roller and use those colors to create a swatch on your own. Um, some other things that are cool, uh, you can create a 
jQuery mobile theme for a specific version. Uh, you can import a theme. So say you have an older, older version uh, theme. You can import that and then upgrade it. Uh, so that makes that easy. And then here's where you download it. Like I said, we start with three, three swatches. And we can add multiple ones by just clicking the plus. And we can add up to 26, one for each letter of the alphabet. So that's theme roller. So if you need any inspiration um, while you're building your, your theme or you're building your application, there's a site called jqmgallery.com. And it provides, it's sort of like a collection of all the sites that are, are using jQuery mobile. And you can you know, see what some of the best ones that are out there. You know, some of them are like OpenTable, Disney World, uh, Khan Academy, SlideShare. And you can see how they're using jQuery mobile. Um, one of my favorite ones is Untapped. Anybody use Untapped? Oh, there we go. Yep, great, guys. So let's talk about the state of the project. Um, we've had a number of releases since our 1.0 release back in November 2001. Our latest major release was uh, 1.3 in February. And we're pretty proud of that. Um, Google Trends, take a look at the popularity of the project. You can see where we started there in 2010 with our alphas and betas. And you know, we just grew popularity. Interesting note there is the little dips, the, the, the major dip there in, around January. That's the Christmas time dip. Apparently, web developers don't work around Christmas time. I don't understand. <laughs> Maybe somebody can explain that to me. Uh, we have a thriving ecosystem. We have plenty of partners that are working you know, to build tools and um, you know, provide uh, developers easy access to uh, building jQuery mobile applications. Um, one of my favorite uh, drag and drop um, applications is Kudiqua. We actually feature this on our, on our homepage right now. And it's a simple drag and drop editor. Um, you can you know, just drag and drop, uh, create a prototype really quickly. Um, and then right there at the top, it says download HTML. So you get an application stubbed out pretty quick, download your HTML, and then you can really start customizing it to what you need. I, I feel it's a, a huge time saver. So one of the things I wanted to, you know, one of the news that came out of uh, you know, our meetings this week is you know, Todd Parker has been the technical lead since uh, the be beginning of the project with Filament Group. And he's decided to step down and, and release the, the lead, the technical lead uh, of the project. You know, he's just facing some time constraints and you know, we, we'd like to honor that. So I'd like to, you know, just a round of applause, just thanking Todd for his effort there. He, he's still going to be a part of the project. He's just not going to be you know, leading it day to day. So uh, with that news, uh, Jasper DeGroote is going to be uh, stepping up as our lead. Jasper, you want to take a stand up there? And you know, I, I don't feel like the project's any, any worse. I think we've actually got a great lead here going forward. So good hands. Um, let's just go over really quickly what, what, what was in the new release in jQuery Mobile 1.3. Uh, 1.3 provided us a new panel widget, uh, a new two-handle range slider widget. Um, it focused on responsive web design. We were able to get a couple of different ways we can do tables responsively, as well, of, as, well as a CSS framework for doing responsive grids. So we take a look at a panel. Um, so some easy markup here. We have uh, a data role of panel to describe, describe it as a panel. We can set its position to be right or left. We can say how it's going to display into the page. Um, or we can reveal it, we can push it, or we can overlay it. Um, and then uh, an ID, and then any kind of content you want within, within the panel. And so, so the way it looks, that's a reveal. Uh, this is overlay. And then a push would just sort of just basically push the page out of the way as the panel came in. You would put that panel H, uh, HTML at the, uh, at the same level as you would put your header, your content, and your footer. So a dual, dual handle slider uh, is a widget to allow you to uh, pick a minimum and maximum value. So here we have you know, just a couple handles. So all we use is just some labels and some input types of range. 
um, and set some min and max values here. Um, and we can, you know, uh, the framework does all the, all the markup and all the enhancements here to, to get us these uh, handles and provide that sliding functionality. Uh, a reflow table, so say we have a table and we get to a, a certain size, uh, it'll, it'll reshift itself so that um, uh, we have columns that are stacked and we have you know, all the, the headers on the, on the left and all the data on the right. And it makes it easier to, to read at, at lower resolutions. We have a column table, so we still have our standard table, but we, we put the uh, power of choice of what columns we want into the user's hands by writing this button, and they can turn on and off uh, columns that they, they want to see. So um, I want to see, see all the ranking of movies. There we go. Uh, grids, so uh, we provided a CSS-based column, CSS based columns that are responsive. So we want columns that sort of stack next to each other. Um, and this quickly here, we provide a, a wrapper div and we give it a class of UI-grid. And then the letter in, uh, signifies you know, how many columns you, you can have uh, two to 10 uh, by using the letter here. And then we just need a div for each column that we're going to have and set its class to UI-block. And then A or B, depending on the uh, number of columns you've got here. So if we look at a three column one, we've got UI grid-B, meaning three, three columns. And then we have divs for each one, UI block A, B, and C. We can have uh, grid A, B, and C, or D here. So we can have up to five, five being responsibly. And, you know, uh, the CSS is uh, determining the percentage of what, what's going to be shown. So that's grids. So let's talk about roadmaps. So this is the exciting part. Um, as we move forward, uh, this has been the case since about 1.2. Uh, we're trying to target a release cycle of uh, every three to four months. Uh, with that cycle comes, uh, we're trying to target a new widget, uh, refactoring ex existing widgets, um, and as well as bug fixes. In jQuery 1.4, uh, our focus is on a comprehensive review of all the widgets. Um, performance improvements is our, uh, a main goal for us. Uh, default theme improvements, uh, and a couple of new widgets, tab, tabs and content container. So that's uh, this widget review we're doing. Uh, we're gonna ensure compliance with uh, the jQuery UI widget factory standards. And Scott's going to come up and you know, talk about uh, UI, but he's been helping the project you know, make sure that we're, are, we're adhering to the standards. And that's going to allow us to main, you know, our widgets to main, maintain state. It's going to increase the performance of them. Um, and a, a big benefit is all these widget, widgets are going to be able to be decoupled from the framework so that you can use them in, say, a responsive web design uh, type of site, but then you can have these touch widgets uh, within your site, and you don't need the, the whole framework uh, loaded just to have access to these widgets. So that, that'll be very exciting. Um, some existing functionality that we're going to be focusing on for, for this release, uh, this, you know, uh, this review is going to happen over multiple releases. We're going to target uh, rewriting header, the, the header widget, the footer widget, pop-up and panels. So how are we going to target performance improvements? Um, like I said, we're going to adhere to the standards of Widget Factory. Um, we're going to simplify the generated markup where possible. So by eliminating um, some wrappers uh, and inner divs uh, wherever possible. Um, some places we won't be able to do that based on you know, older devices. But we'll try to do, uh, do our best to sort of simplify the markup and use what's there already. And then, um, so less, less Markup means less DOM manipulation, which the less we touch the DOM, the better performance we're going to gain. And then theme improvements. This is, this is going to be a big, a big change, I would, I would assume. Uh, we're going to sort of uh, redo our default theme. Uh, everything is going to default to the A swatch, so no more header and footer A and content C. Uh, we're going to provide a new default theme. 
Uh, it's going to uh, be sort of a flat design. We're going to go with that flat design, get rid of some of the ingredients, sort of, you know, upgrade our design to the, the styles that we're seeing um, other vendors using. We're going to reduce the number of swatches from five down to two or three. We haven't decided yet. Um, and the reason why we're doing this is sort of to encourage developers to build custom themes on their own. We're seeing a lot of applications that are using default themes, and we want to really encourage that creativity in themes. Um, and theme inheritance will now be done through uh, the CSS instead of the uh, adding classes to elements that, are, uh, that, get, that get generated. So that'll, that'll help with in performance as well. We're going to move away from a sprited uh, icon set to using SVG for icons. And uh, we'll provide fallbacks where possible uh, for those devices that don't support SVG. Um, tabs, we're going to base this new widget off the jQuery UI tabs widget. We basically started by copying it. Um, and the styles for the tabs are going to be uh, more based on jQuery mobile versus jQuery UI. Uh, the other widget is a content container. And so uh, you can think about this, uh, a great example of where you would do this, if you look at the old jQuery mobile docs, you had the navigation on the left, you had the content on the right. Those could both be sitting inside of a new content container. And um, so you would basically just have a page for your menu, a page for all your content, and then you can just control what goes into the other content container by cl clicking on the menu. So that should. Uh, help with you know, uh, not duplicating menus and that kind of thing. So when, are we, when can we expect all this? Um, I th think, Jasper, we can have a beta by end of June, beginning of July? Beginning of July, he says. Um, so uh, look for that coming out. We'd love to see, some you, know, see you guys testing that and uh, providing some bug reports uh, into our GitHub account. So that's all I got. Um, if you have gone out to the, um, the swag table out there, you'll notice we have some jQuery mobile t-shirts and, and uh, hats uh, which is, and stickers, which is the first time we've had swag uh, available for the project, which is, Jasper, you want to you wanna showcase the shirt here? Yeah, and then that, the guy over there, he's got a hat on, uh, so if you want to take a look at what he, Yep, you, yep, you, I'm looking. Yeah, there you go. He's got a hat. And then, uh, the, you know, the stickers are available too. So, uh, yeah, please go, if you've got tokens left, go, go buy that and, like, show off, show off jQuery Mobile Pride to uh, the rest of the community. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Scott Gonzalez, who's going to talk about uh, jQuery UI. Okay, um, I'm Scott Gonzalez, and I'd like to start off with just a little bit of history about jQuery UI. Uh, so uh, next week, actually I think it's on Monday, will be exactly six years from the first commit to jQuery UI. Uh, so the project's been going for a pretty long time, and in that time we've done 42 stable releases uh, with a total of 75 releases, so that includes alphas, betas, RCs, and milestones. Uh, we have 241 contributors, but that number isn't correct. Um, we had this issue where we started the project in SVN, and then we imported it into Git. And when we did the import, uh, we didn't get the full history because we had like moved the project around several times. Uh, did, did anyone use jQuery UI back when it was in the jQuery core SVN repository? Yeah. <laughs> One person. Um, so it, it bounced around uh, a few different times within that repo. So like we lost a bunch of history during the import. Um, but in Git, we have 241 contributors. That's pretty big, right? We saw the graph yesterday in the infrastructure talk about how many contributors there were to jQuery core. Uh, so the initial release came out in September 2007, and it was intended to replace Interface. Did anybody use Interface? Probably not if nobody used jQuery UI. Uh, so Interface existed. Um, in the early days of jQuery core. And it was 
very similar to what jQuery UI is today. Uh, it had things like drag and drop. I think it had autocomplete. Um, but at some point, um, I think during the 1, 2 release phase for jQuery core, in it, the developer that was maintaining interface stopped maintaining it, and we started the jQuery UI project. Um, so in order to do this, Paul Bacaus, who was leading the project, wrote a whole bunch of new plugins, uh, but he also pulled in existing popular plugins, like the Tabs plugin from Klaus Hartl, the Date Picker from Mark Verbansky and Keith Wood, uh, the Accordion widget from Jörn Zephyr, and uh, you know, that got us a real quick release. It was three months from the first commit to the first release. Uh, so as soon as we do the 1.0 release, like every other software project, you, know, you immediately start fixing bugs and adding features, because that's what everyone wants. Um, but with all the various contributors that we had, there was like this huge inconsistency within the library. And not just coding style. Right? There's plenty of inconsistency in the coding styles. But the APIs and how you use the plugins were different, because you, know, you have plugins that were just started, plugins that have been around for a year or two. Um, it was just like this big hodgepodge. So we started doing an initial cleanup, and we were trying to find like, what are the coding standards of jQuery UI. Uh, so then we, after we got some initial updates in there, we started working on uh, you know, how do we clean up the design. So in, uh, after 1.5, we started doing a bunch of markup changes, kind of uh, defining a CSS framework. Um, Filament Group built the first theme roller, and they created a whole bunch of pre-built themes, which everyone is still using today. Uh, and so that was like nine months that we worked on that, and then we put out 1.7, because we like skipping version numbers, right? Um, <laughs> so then after we did that, we realized we can't just keep like, doing a release and then going back and like, picking one portion of the project and like, completely overhauling it. So we decided we'll do this, uh, a new design process, and in 1.8, what we tried to do was come up with a list of use cases for, for whatever plugin we were working on. And then what, you know, sit down and say, what would happen if we had a widget that had absolutely no options? You know, how many use cases could we actually solve? And based on that, we would say, um, you know, this use case isn't solved but with, without an option, so we need an option to solve this common use case. Uh, and then you know, like, what events are going to be helpful for building your own customizations if you don't have options? And we would just go back and forth and try and come up with you know, the minimal number of options that serve the maximal number of use cases. And we'd build a prototype based on that. And then while we were building the prototype, we would you know, run into issues and say, oh, you know, it, users are probably going to have problems with this area, so we should either add an option or you know, add more events so that people can do whatever customizations they need. Uh, and then after we have the prototype and do our second review, we'd go out and build you know, what we actually want to release. And that worked really well for us. Uh, in fact, it worked so well that we decided we were going to do it to everything that we had already released. Right? We were just going to go back and redesign everything from, from scratch. Uh, and at the same time, we were going to do lots of cleanup, right? reduce our bug counts, um, write a bunch of documentation for stuff. and. That was like a huge undertaking. And we, we decided it was also a good idea to completely overhaul our infrastructure. Um, so <laughs> we spent 31 months doing this. And we didn't finish. <laughs> so, so what were we doing? Right? We, were, we were actually, um, we had our set of use cases already for all the existing widgets. We knew you know, we had written however many options on each widget. and. You know, the, these things have been released for two or three years. We knew what people were trying to do. And we sat down, ignored the API we had, and we said, if we're, you know, if we're building this today with no options, what would it look like? And then we have our use cases, and we went through the full design process for every single widget. Um, but in addition to doing that, we needed to provide back compat for the old API, right? Because if we just completely release new widgets, everyone would be pretty mad at us. Uh, so what we did was, we built the new APIs, and when we finished the design, we then looked back at the old API and say, how do we bridge the gap? And we rebuilt the old APIs on top of the new APIs, and we did that for one major release. So as we're going through our widgets, we do the API redesign, we layer on the back compat, put it behind a flag that is on by default, and we release it. At the next major release, we rip out the back compat. So you, um, you can actually upgrade immediately, and in theory, nothing should break. 
Then you have however long it takes us to do our next major release to go through and update all your code before you have to worry about you know, actually transitioning away from the old APIs. And that means you get all of the bug fixes, all the performance improvements, any new widgets that came out um, without having to worry about doing the API upgrades. Uh, in addition to that, we wanted full accessibility. And accessibility testing is like way harder than just cross-browser testing. Uh, so this takes up a lot of time, especially all the standards are very new and they don't work everywhere. Uh, so you end up doing lots and lots of workarounds to try and make things accessible. Uh, so we worked on that for two and a half years. At the same time, we were, over, we were um, doing a complete infrastructure overhaul. Right? We were building a new website, building a new API documentation site, building a new download builder, new theme roller. Um, and we were integrating with the new plugin site. But the problem is the plugin site didn't exist. So we had to build a plugin site <laughs> so that we could verify that we were going to integrate with it. Um, so that was a lot of fun. <laughs> Because the 1.9 release came out first, and so like, we had to get far enough along in the plugin site to know that what we were putting into 1.9 was going to work with what we eventually released. And luckily, it did. So that's good. Um, but after two years of doing this, Yearn was getting really, really impatient. Uh, you know, he, he was like, we need to just release 1.9, and we we're only like halfway through. So what we decided was everything that we had already started, we were going to finish. And everything that we hadn't started was going to get pushed to 1.10. Um, right? So this like, massive, massive 1.9 roadmap got cut in half, uh, probably a little more than half, because we weren't going to cut any of our infrastructure changes. So we had to like, finish all our infrastructure, finish the API redesigns for anything we'd started. Everything else, all the other API redesigns were getting pushed to 1.10. Uh, so, that's what we did. We actually eventually released 1.9. Then uh, three months later, we released 1.10, right? which seems like a huge difference, right? 31 months and three months, but we only cut it in half. Uh, what ended up happening was, before we even released 1.9, we split our roadmap again and made 1.10 like the smallest release we could. Because one of the things that we're trying to do is work closely with other open source projects. And um, we were talking to the Drupal team about what we could do to improve the usage of jQuery UI within Drupal. I think there were, at the time they were only using Sortable, uh, and it was in their admin UI. And they said that they were, uh, they were coming up on the Drupal 8 release. They needed to add a dialogue component. And so you know, we said, well, what, what are the issues that you're having with our dialogue component? We'll make sure to get them addressed, and we'll release in time for your Drupal 8 code freeze. Uh, so we had some discussions about that. We actually worked with them on some of the accessibility improvements. And this benefits everybody, because now Drupal developers can focus on writing a CMS, and we can focus on writing UI components, and we both get what we need. Right? We get to find out um, you know, what use cases are we not serving, what accessibility issues are we having that we weren't aware of, um, what, and they get to just pull that in and have a solution. Um, so we're also working with them on getting autocomplete into uh, Drupal to replace their, their custom autocompletes. That way, again, they can stop putting effort towards something that's not their core focus and, and actually focus on building up their product. Um, so what we did was we split the existing 110 roadmap into just dialogue, and then everything else moved into 111. And we were able to push out uh, the 110 release and get everything that Drupal needed out way before their code freeze. Uh, at the same time, we were still doing cleanup across every, like, all of our components, and we're writing lots of documentation. Uh, so this is another interesting way to view the history of the project. Right? This is ticket count from the beginning of when we had a jQuery UI specific bug tracker. So we started in jQuery Core's bug tracker just like we started in jQuery Core's SVN repository. Um, so this first big red spike is not like this massive influx of bugs. It's an import of all the bugs from jQuery Core's bug tracker. Uh, and then the, this one, two, three, four, fifth big blue spike is the 1.5 release. So you can see going from 1.0 to 1.5, we had a couple of like concentrated days of just like very focused bug fixing. Um, or th these could also be you know, implementing new features, right? because there, there's no distinction on this graph. Uh, so you can see that from 1.0 to 1.5, we actually had like, these very big spikes. But overall, our issue count actually increased, even with all those spikes. Um, then we go a couple more months, and we get to this 
series of 1.6 RCs. Uh, you might be wondering why there were four RCs in such a short period of time and why they had this like massive influx of tickets. And uh, it's not a period of time I like to talk about. So <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just jump to the 1.7 release. Uh, you can see there is a spike of bug fixes right before the release. Uh, it didn't really help our bug count at all. Uh, about a month later, we released 1.6, same thing. Closed a bunch of tickets, but our issue count is still higher. Uh, yes, and those are out of order. It's, like I said, it's a bad time. Um, then we got to the 1.8 release, and right before the release, we had a couple of alphas, we had some betas. That we actually had like a lot of pre-releases for 1.8. Um, but during the alpha phase, we, we just fixed a ton of bugs, and you can see this huge drop. Uh, then we got to the RCs, and people actually started testing. <laughs> If you guys could test alphas and betas, it would be much better than if you could test RCs, because then we can actually make changes. Um, so we release the RCs, people start testing, and we get bug reports. And then we get into this phase of, like, let's fix everything and work on 1.9. Um, and there's some interesting things going on here. You can see a bunch of blue spikes, right? We're going through API redesigns. And during the API redesign, one of the goals is every widget has less than 10 bugs at the end. Um, so like as we're rewriting the, the new APIs, we were focusing on all the bugs related to whatever option or event or just design change we were working on and fixing all those bugs. Uh, so our bug count was going down. But then you see these big red spikes. And these red spikes are actually not bug reports. Uh, these are the API redesigns. So for every single change that we make, we end up with two tickets in our issue tracker. All right, we have one that's like, deprecate this old option and replace it with this new option. And then we have another one that says remove this old option in a future version. Uh, so you can see like the biggest red spike is followed by a big blue spike. And the, the points on the yellow line are actually about the same. So what that shows is even though we were fixing bugs, right? because we're, we're going through the API redesign, we're implementing these new features, and as we implement them, we fix bugs. The, the total count didn't drop, right? Like, you can actually see over time it's just constantly increasing. And this is a period where we did 24 patch releases, and, and we averaged about 10 bug fixes per release. Um, so we're talking about uh, 250 bug fixes about just in the 1.8 release family with this steady climb in bugs. Um, so th that's not actually maintainable, even though it seems like we're doing really well, right? Like, we had over 40 stable releases, and. Um, constantly bug fixing, we're, we're averaging about a release a month, and yet our bug count just keeps going up and up and up. Uh, but then at the very end of this, you can see this yellow line is just dropping. That's the 1.9 release. So you see this like massive concentrated blue spike. What happened was we had the 1.9 release. All of the infrastructure tickets got closed, because we used to track infrastructure tickets in the same bug tracker as the jQuery UI tickets. Uh, because that was the only bug tracker we had. Now all of our infrastructure is on GitHub, right? So we have jQueryUI.com repo, an API.jQueryUI.com repo, a download.jQueryUI.com repo. Uh, so all of our infrastructure got pushed out. But one of the interesting things is when we fix a bug in code, we immediately close the ticket because it's available for people to see in Git, right? Like you, you could do a checkout of jQueryUI that day and get the bug fix. Um, but when we fixed a bug on our infrastructure, like somebody reported a bug about the website, we would fix it, but we didn't deploy sites unless we were doing a release. And so these tickets would stay open until the release happened so that we could verify that it actually was fixed on production, because we had these horrible systems where we couldn't really test anything. Um, and everything is much better now. So that's part of the big blue spike is um, all the infrastructure tickets. But then it continues because right after the 1.9 release, we had a developer summit. We had a whole bunch of people come in. Everyone worked on various parts of the project. And there was a concentrated effort on um, bug triage and bug fixing. So we were able to close a lot of either invalid or duplicate tickets, and we were able to land a lot of uh, fixes. And then following that, uh, TJ Vantol and Mike Sharav spent a lot of time just going through every single ticket in our tracker and either fixing bugs or um, finding that the duplicates, finding they were invalid, you know, or if they were valid, adding reduced test cases. And you know, that, that helped. We dropped from like almost 900 tickets to uh, about 400 pretty quickly. 
And we've been doing pretty good over there. You can see with the 1.9 release, there was a bit of a jump up, but immediately following that, it comes back down and it's starting to climb up a little. So we expect that pattern to, to continue where it goes up a little and then, and then drops and then goes up a little and then drops. Uh, but we don't expect this massive climb to continue. Uh, so the API redesigns will help a lot with that, right? The code is much easier to maintain now. There are just fewer options, but we're still solving the same use cases. Uh, so before, you know, you'd have like a lot of similar options and you'd use them together and you'd get uh, like kind of unexpected results. And so uh, the, the key is really coming up with new ways of designing an API that prevent users from getting in these situations. Uh, so it's easier for them to choose, you know, what is the option I actually want to get the behavior that I need. Uh, we can also see that jQuery UI is continuing to grow in usage. We are up to, I think that's like 18% now of the top million sites. Uh, we expect this to just continue to grow and grow and grow even as HTML5 comes out with newer features. Um, if anyone saw TJ's talk, there's, there's still a lot of issues uh, even once you use native controls. You just, you lose a lot of flexibility and so we don't expect um, the need for JavaScript libraries to go away even for UI components. Uh, so getting into the present and the future, we're currently working on the 111 release. At this point, we've split into uh, 111, 112, and 113 before we get to 2.0. And the details of that keep changing, so um, it, it's more important to just talk about what we pl plan on getting done rather than what will be in a specific release. So we'll finish the API redesigns, um, we're going to improve our effects. Uh, th there's a lot of um, tricky stuff going on when you're working with effects and like trying to do clip animations. And uh, we, we have a new idea for how to solve that problem. Uh, we're continuing to work on improved accessibility. We're working with standards bodies, trying to get ARIA improved so that the spec works, uh, solves issues better, the browsers implement the spec better. Um, but so just some general concepts that we're focusing on are improving our documentation, right? Historically, jQuery UI has pretty bad documentation. Like half our stuff wasn't documented. The documentation we did have wasn't very complete. So we've been working on documenting our theming, documenting the widget factory, which is probably like the most uh, under-documented feature we have. That's the most popular. Like, well, well should be the most popular. It's, it's one of the most powerful things we have, but very few people actually know about it. Um, we're doing a better job of documenting our effects and getting examples and demos of the effects into our website uh, and writing tutorials. Now that we have the jQuery Learning Center, it's much easier to um, you know, write documentation that makes sense for jQuery UI because um, you know, our widgets are so featureful that just having one long page that's like, here's a million things you can do with this widget would be pretty hard to actually read through and, and find what you're looking for. Uh, so having the jQuery Learning Center to um, add tutorials to in addition to having just the strict API documentation is a big help. So we're trying to flesh that out. So if anyone's interested in writing some tutorials, um, there's plenty of content that can be written on the learning site. Uh, we'd like to get better form control support. So right now we only have a couple of form controls like date picker, autocomplete, um, spinners, and we'd like to just flesh that out, support all the native form controls, and then try and add a couple more custom form controls. But in addition to that, we want uh, consistent styling for forms. So right now, even when you put a date picker on your page, the text field is still just like a plain old text field, because if we style it, it's going to look really out of place in the rest of your form. Um, but then at the same time, we have things like buttons. So you put your buttons in your form, and they stand out from the rest of your form controls. Uh, so we'd like to have consistent styling, and then once we have consistent styling for all form controls, we'd like to go back and add styling to the form controls that we have. So things like autocomplete and date picker would match the new styles that we have. Um, so along with that, we'd have, uh, we want to build a new CSS framework, right? A lot of the stuff that Ralph was talking about that's in jQuery mobile now, um, we'd like to get that to be like a standalone CSS framework that's useful without JavaScript. And then we'll use it with JavaScript in jQuery UI and jQuery mobile. And you know, we'll have responsive design. We'll have all these page layout features. Um, so if we can, we'd like to collaborate with other CSS framework projects and see what we can do to like, reduce the number of choices and just get everyone uh, trying to you know, have a, a standard um, maybe naming convention that they use that it doesn't matter really what you're doing. You, people can produce markup that's going to work across different frameworks. And you know, as Ralph talked about with new, new icons, we're trying to figure out what's the best solution. 
Um, so far, it does seem like going with SVG with the fallbacks will be the best. And so when that lands in jQuery mobile, we'll then land it in jQuery UI as well. Uh, we're also working on pointer events. How many people know what pointer events are? A couple. So, okay, so the goal is for everyone in here to use pointer events and stop using mouse and touch. Um, pointer events are device agnostic pointing events. So if you think about when you touch something, you actually just have two pointers or three pointers or one pointer, however many touches you actually have. And pointer events give you a single event per touch and um, you can actually track what's going on. So you can, it gives you the, essentially the same functionality as touch events, but with the standard event model, right? Like you don't have this touches array on an event. So like things like page X and page Y are where you expect them to be. Uh, we're working with the Polymer team to improve their polyfill so it'll have back, uh, it'll have support all the way back to IE6. Uh, and then we'll start relying on that and we'll just build that into everything we do and we'll, we'll stop using mouse events within our code. And so this will finally bring touch event support to jQuery UI. Um, in the meantime, just use touch punch. Uh, and web components, we're investigating web components. Uh, TJ mentioned that there are still lots of issues with it. Uh, we we want to make sure that whatever does eventually get released by the browsers is actually a useful solution. So we're working closely with um, you know, the standards bodies and browser vendors trying to figure out how to solve the problems that we want solved and make sure that it's gonna be useful for everybody. Uh, and so a lot of this just comes to emerge with mobile, right? Like a lot of the stuff that we're talking about is stuff that mobile's working on, we're working on it. Uh, the goal is to just get one set of widgets that works everywhere, they'll live in jQuery UI, they'll get pulled into jQuery mobile, they shouldn't have to do any um, adjustments on those widgets, they should just work everywhere and then mobile will continue to provide the page layout and uh, Ajax navigation system that it has today. It'll just be built on top of UI controls. So then, you know, at that point, we'll have a single CSS framework, a single theme roller, and, um, you know, there, there won't be the confusion that there is today about jQuery UI and jQuery mobile. So, thanks. Um, it's Ralph back there. Ralph, do you want to come up for questions? Uh, so I think we have two or three minutes we can take some questions. Um, so the question is, do we have a release schedule published anywhere? Uh, the jQuery UI roadmap is at wiki.jQueryUI.com slash roadmap. Uh, we do update it as we make changes. So it's, um, it basically right now just lists the widgets that we're working on, either for a redesign or a new implementation. But it will mention other things like, oh, do an effects rewrite or improve the demo system. And that's, that'll all be listed on wiki.jquery.com slash roadmap. For the mobile roadmap, do you, do you pl have plans past one major release? Uh, I don't think we, we, we've got some plans, but we don't have any concrete like, yeah. what's going in what release or anything like that. Yeah, so for the mobile roadmap, it's you know what is on the 1.4 plate. And I, I think you really get an, issue, uh, an idea for what's going on there at the GitHub issue tracker. There's a wiki page for uh, our roadmap on the uh, GitHub, GitHub account. So, um, for jQuery Mobile, uh, what is the So, yeah. Yeah, so um, the question was, um, they do a lot of custom design work on, uh, with the designs that they're getting from the designers, and is there a way to get like a base 
um, jQuery mobile theme without all the um, uh, added added cruft there to it. Uh, structure? So. Yeah, you can use so, the you can use the download builder to pick and choose what you want. So um, there there is currently like a jQuery Mobile started with a tight integration between the widgets and the Ajax navigation and the and the page layout and all that. And there's a lot of work going on right now to split that out. Uh, so the goal is widgets that work everywhere on their own, and then a page layout system that works on its own, and an Ajax navigation system that works on its own, and they all get layered together in jQuery Mobile. So if what you want is just the Ajax and page layout, you could pull that in, and then you could use whatever widget you want. But another thing that's happening right now is simplification of the markup and styling. And so the goal is to make it easy for you to do completely custom styling while using the full framework if you want. So somehow make it, I, I, we have come our, uh, up with workarounds for that, so, so, make it easier to do that. So um, if anyone didn't hear that, it's, he's using Backbone for the page transitions and, and navigation system. Uh, so the, the goal is that the individual widgets will be completely standalone, and all you're really looking for at that point is auto initialization, uh, which is easily built as just a layer, which is what um, mobile does right now. It's actually a layer on top of the base widget factor that says all widgets just read uh, options out of attributes, and then they just have a few lines of code that say, you know, on, when, a, when a new page is loaded, just go through looking for these things and initialize them. Uh, so you can easily do that with Backbone and, and take just, so at some point it will be take just widgets from jQuery UI and use Backbone on top of it. Um, which right now you could do that with jQuery Mobile and just, I, I don't know how hard it is like exactly today to rip out just the Ajax and having page stuff, but the, they're working um, very hard on that like there's, for the past few months. There's a lot of good examples of that online. Like people do integrate back on the jQuery Mobile. Can, can, can we just get her first? For which project, mobile or UI, or both? Sure. Right, yeah, so the, the question is, uh, are we looking to build uh, best practices or, or uh, recommendations for that out, out online? And y the, the answer to that is yes, we're, we're, we want to do that. Um, we need to find the right volunteers and the time to do that. We're, we're, we're looking to publish on the learn, learn.jquery.org or com. Uh, so, so now we have. Oh, the, and then the we also have the de the demo center too, as well. Yeah. Of course, that was a slide I cut to make time. Okay. And the last yeah. Question. So, um, I, I just had one more comment about uh, about the the. Uh, functionality separation. Uh, basically our goal, one of our goals for 1.4, and that, that's to, to add to the answer to your question, is to make sure that, that given, given a choice of even just a single widget on the download builder, that that widget is fully functional within a plain JS page. So you get the CSS that you need, you get the JS that you need, and it will work in a plain JS page. So, so it, it disturbs as little the, the overall design of your site as possible. And uh, so, so, so we're doing this per widget to make sure that all the all the interdependencies have been have been addressed. And so you can just you can just uh, eventually uh, take as little or as much as as, as you want. So if you want the navigation, then obviously that's not going to work with Backbone. But if you just want a widget, then you can still use the Backbone navigation. All right. If you have any more questions, we'll be around all day. <laughs> <laughs>